Welcome. My name is Matthew Brown. I'm the director of the Center for Values in Medicine, Science, and Technology. Thank you for being here tonight. I understand we have some members of the Arts and Humanities Advisory Council in the audience. Thank you for your support of the school and of the center as well. Um, and uh, thanks also to the, uh, uh, my colleagues, students, and community members who are here in the audience uh, for this event. Um, our speaker tonight is Sean Vaez. He's, uh, he's an associate professor at Lyman Briggs College and the Department of Philosophy uh, at Michigan State University. He's also a faculty excellence advocate. I'm not <laughs> sure what it is, but it sounds great. I wish I would had one of those for me. Um, he's the author of the 2018 book, Philosophy of Population Health, Philosophy for a New Public Health Era. His work um, uh, does a great job of, of exploring the deep connections between ethical issues and issues of evidence and knowledge, as well as bridging er uh, the areas of health and society. Um, he's got a great talk for you tonight here on zip codes, genetic codes, and envisioning an equitable culture of health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vaez. Hello, and thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Uh, thinking back on my life, and like how often would I actually give up an evening to go to a lecture? It's like, like credit to you, you are better people than I am. <laughs> I'm here because I have to be in the front of the room. Like, would I actually be an attendee? Like, I wish I were that person. Um, so um, I'm not sure how many of you, how many of you actually got the, t the QR code to work or were able to access the, okay, so good number of you. Yeah, not necessary. Um, so, uh, t so the reason I, s I start with giving that link is um, I find there's a lot about the, what I'll be talking about today that's, that's deeply counterintuitive for some people, but also not for everybody. And so I'm gonna to try to sort of navigate the fact that some, some of what I'll be talking about is gonna be very um, hard, to, hard to sort of digest or seem like weird or wrong. Um, and others of you will be sort of like nodding along. So, um, so I'll, I'll try to work on that. And um, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to ask hard questions during Q&A. So, um, so what I'm going to be presenting today is a spin-off from the book that, that Matt mentioned, uh, where I was essentially looking at what is this thing called population health, this thing that was in the 1990s, a concept that was not really even mentioned. So there was this phrase population health was basically never mentioned ever. It was a few, few dozen times a year in PubMed, sort of like the big database of all medical publications. And now it's up to over 10,000. And so I was, wrote a book on like what happened with that? What does that mean? So. Um, what I'm interested in is essentially the growth of a couple of different catchphrases for about how to think about things like this. So this is, um, so this is part of Dallas, it's not all of it. Um, and uh, I imagine a lot of you have already looked this, looked at this part of the country. Whenever I put up that, when I put up that link, people will sort of intuitively just kind of try to find their, find their house. <laughs> it's like, oh, what happens if I? <laughs> so the fir first time I got my hands on this, I went to, I went to like my, where my parents live, my family house in Massachusetts. And it's like, oh, look, two blocks away from our, our family house, the, the life expectancy drops off 10 years. I'm like, 10 years? Damn, that's a lot of years. <laughs> that's a decade. What's going on? And so, um, so that, that counterintuitive thing, what I, what I want to try to do is to give a sense of the scale of some of the disparities uh, inside, uh, inside population health, because that's part of the point is, um, is a matter of the scale of the problems that we're dealing with, as opposed to just what's included as part of the problems. So I'll talk about things like the fact that health that healthcare disparities are a big part of our, a big part of our problems, but healthcare disparities are not the extent of our problems when it comes to creating our health problems. Um, so there is a distinction. So I cross reference these numbers of life expectancy with um, countries that have the same life expectancy, not to cast dispersion on any of the countries, um, uh, but just to point out that this is sort of the scale of what we're talking about, because we have, we have ideas about how deeply different certain places are. It's like, oh, that's, that place is worlds away. They have terrible health in this place. They have great health in this place. Um, actually, there, as much variation as there, as there is out in the world, we have almost as much inside a city sometimes blocks away. And so you can be in the center of, so you can be in, over here, and you can be somewhere, somewhere in the vicinity of being uh, the life expectancy of the US or Cuba. Interesting, they're tied. Might have read the news about that. Over here, you have Ukraine and Cape Verde. Go, go a couple miles away, you're in Mongolia or Turkmenistan levels of health. 
go a little bit farther north, Chile or Costa Rica, and then go up, up over here in Highland Park. And uh, apparently we're above, above the life expectancy of Japan, which is the highest in the world. So this is the, this is the scope of what we're talking about. And, the, um, and to give another sort of benchmark for the, for the, for the numbers here, um, the CDC has basically has tried doing an estimate of what would happen if magically people stopped dying of cancer tomorrow. Uh, the life expectancy would go up 3.2 years. So this is, the, this is the kind of numbers we're dealing with. So for reasons very much like that, um, there have been a, there's been the growth of a couple of catchphrases inside the field of population health. And I'm very interested in the way we talk about um, scientific findings and, and medical findings because how we communicate this kind of information, something like that map, is very, very important. It's, it's easy to get it right, or it's not easy to get it right, it's very easy to get it wrong and maybe caught, make things even worse. So one of the catchphrases that's starting to, starting to appear, it shows up inside press releases from universities like Harvard. It shows up in article titles like this one on, on um, mother child health. And it's showing up in places like NBC News. So what affects your health more? Is it your DNA code or your zip code? Um, or saying your zip code is more important than your DNA code. And so some sort of comparison between these two. And meanwhile, there's this new catchphrase sort of as like the umbrella concept for population health, which is this idea of, of what's called a culture of health. And as a catchphrase, it's like, oh, culture, health, okay, I kind of get it. What does that mean? And so I wanna, I'm going to dig into that a little bit, say like, okay, what do they mean when they say something like culture of health? So this is, over there is the main textbook inside the field of population health. Um, down here, we have the, the work of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. That's the largest um, health-only um, uh, NGO inside the United States. Um, culture of health is sort of their main thing. And up there is the National Academy of Medicine uh, basically saying like we have a culture of health plan too. So um, this, is, this is building off of my book on philosophy of population health. And um, so, the, so to give you a sense, the, that, that term population health, um, it's been disputed ever since it ever got coined. And that's part of why it's interesting to me. So at the heart of it is this, is that it's some sort of counter, counterpoint to whatever is considered to be traditional public health thinking. And there's a little bit of a rhetoric in sort of saying like whatever traditional means there. Um, but it's this idea that we should take a very broad view on the causes of what's, uh, causes of our health. And so what are all the things that are affecting us? Things like food policy and outdoor space, things like that. Um, all the effects of health. And so thinking broadly about what this, about what health health impacts have on things like our family structures and our, and our lives and gender norms, things like that. And also who should be involved in the process of trying to address health problems. And so it's not just the university epidemiologists and public health departments, it's also community activists. So these are all tied together on this idea of, of health being broad and big. So I'm interested in, uh, in, this, in this, uh, this problem of how to talk about it and the way it's being talked about because there are ways it can go badly. Um, I think an interesting counterpoint here would be something like evidence-based medicine. How many of you are familiar with that term? People from healthcare, probably. So that one is um, that one's very controversial, and this isn't a, a comment on, on what I think about evidence-based medicine. But even in the in the term of this idea of what's called evidence-based medicine, which is a sort of a, a view of approaching medicine that that prioritizes what, what kind of information we can gather from doing randomized control trials of basically experimental data is the most important information we can use inside healthcare. We should not be using people's intuitions. We should not be using clinical judgment as much as we should be using hard medical data. So there's a, essentially an othering of other kind of information. So like, who's, who's anti-evidence? Like, no one says they're anti-evidence, but it's like, no, we have evidence-based medicine, unlike everyone else who's just totally making it up. Um, and so there's some work by, for example, Maya Goldenberg has written about this. And there's also even rhetoric where the, the, that field had, had sort of framed itself as being a radical revolutionary shift away from everything else that had happened before. They adopted the, the language of Thomas Kuhn and said, we are a revolution and we are leading a paradigm shift. And so our medicine is totally not like anybody else's. And I'm like, is it actually like, well, it's different, but like, is it actually that deeply different? Probably not according to that definition. So I'm very interested in how we actually talk about this stuff because uh, it is very possible to, um, to essentially have misleading ideas out there in the world. So here's a brief, brief view on what my take is gonna be on this stuff. So are zip codes more important than genetic codes? Um, first of all, I think it's, it's fundamentally a flawed way of asking a question. There, there is no such thing as, um, as genetic versus environmental. It doesn't really work that way. And I, you might feel, a couple of you are nodding along because you kind of get it already, but it gets a little bit tangled inside there. Uh, it's, 
And there's also the question of more important for what? And so there are different goals we can have with health promotion, and some of them are going to be totally different from each other. And so it's not just a question of more important, but more important for whom? And for what purposes? And then there's this question of, well, is a culture of health the thing that we're looking for? Is that the concept that we're, we want to be organizing our efforts around? And I want to break that down in there. There's actually two different claims that are being made there, and I think both need to be sort of looked at more carefully. One is that this idea that it takes something as broad as cultural change in order to promote health, and so it's not just one sector of society. It's not just, for example, fixing health care. It's fixing all different parts of society, so it's going vastly this way. But there's also a depth element where it's not just that we need to sort of make changes to these things. We might actually need to fundamentally make, make changes from the top down. In the, or sorry, from, um, I prefer to think from bottom up. <laughs> Uh, but, they're, but they're basically their deep-rooted problems that have to do with what do we want out of our lives, what kind of societies do we think are fair or just, how can we make a better, a better structure in our world, that kind of thing. So this field of population health or population health science, um, it started getting kicked off in the 1990s um, with this volume by the Canadian Institute of Advanced Research asking why are some people healthy and others not? So thinking back to that map, like what is up with that? Why are some people doing well and others not? And as Keyes and Galea put it in their, their main text on this, it's a research program that confronts the structural forces that place individuals at risk, creates distributions of health and disease unequally across socially defined groups, and focuses on embedding biological pathways within social interactions that develop across the life course and across generations. And there's a hell of a lot in there, but that's kind of the point. So it's thinking about the way the, the way um, health is transmitted across generations. It's thinking about how, it's, how it develops over an, an entire person's lifetime. It's talking about structures and social, uh, social interactions. And so all of that's all part of, the, part of what they're concerned with. And as some actual cr um, critics of the field have put it, but I think they're right about describing what it is, um, it has a focus on health disparities. So those disparities between neighborhoods, for instance. Um, as particularly disparities related to socioeconomic status. And many of the proponents have a pessimistic view of the degree to which healthcare can reduce these disparities. I know I do, but it's complicated. Uh, by the way, I would, um, when I showed that map of like which areas of Dallas seem to be doing best, was that sort of lining up with your sense about like which areas of Dallas are doing well? Like, it's every time I put up one of those, I was like, I don't, I don't know what this means, but you know what this means, don't you? <laughs> like, I just learned like 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 Highland Park is like, oh, that's what that means. Okay, <laughs> I don't know anything about Highland Park. <laughs> it's, just, it's like just a nothing to me. <laughs> So the, the intuitive desire when people are trying to make these, these um, do these assessments of like what's going wrong, how can we do better, um, there's this intuitive desire to try to want to find some sort of comparisons between which things are more important than other ones. Um, so we want to quantify how much does this matter, um, how much does access to good health care matter compared to access to housing? That's a fairly, th that's a good question. Um, uh, would Dallas be better off spending more on a new hospital branch or on some sort of uh, some sort of affordable food program? Like these are real questions that actually the policymakers have to deal with. Um, and so that as a result, you have things like this model. Um, this is a very w widely used one that's used in a, in a program that does uh, um, essentially rankings of how well different counties are doing. And so they're looking at so they basically um, said, okay, we're going to take consider the forty percent of um, of uh, the health of an area is due to social and economic factors, things like education and employment, and 10% are due to the physical environment, and 30% are due to individual behaviors, and we're going to sort of add those all up and say that's what yields a to the sort of total health of an area. And obviously there's, it's, there's like sort of like a rounding kind of thing, but there, this is the, the idea is like, well, we can't sort of double count everything. We want to sort of make comparisons. But the problem is it doesn't really work that way. So, it, um, so Jim Tabry is a philosopher of biology who's written, who's written an entire book about this, um, essentially uh, inside the, written inside the context of the history of nature versus nurture. And the title gives pretty much the thesis, which is that it's not just versus anything. And so nature and nurture interact. And so that maybe it should not be too, uh, too shocking, but it has, a lot of, um, it has a lot of philosophical questions sort of built into there. So, um, so inside, uh, so inside this, this, uh, this uh, question of nature versus nurture, there are questions about the nature of interactions between genes and environments. Um, biologists call this G cross E. 
And then there's also, they're also very, very shallowly under the surface. There are essentially debates over political proxy wars and theoretical bi biology proxy wars. So when people are talking about nature versus nurture, they're talking about what is the nature of, uh, what, is, uh, what are our theories about the way biology works, and also how we want societies to work. And they're very closely related, and I'll, I'll elaborate on in a second. So take something like myopia. So it's, um, this is a group of, of Americans over so like, like in, a, in the adult age, roughly. And so probably just shy of half of the people in this room will have myopia. And so nearsightedness, I see a lot of glasses in the room. Some of you are probably wearing contacts. This is a, this is a fairly typical trait. And so, so there's a question, what is causing myopia? Well, then it gets a little complicated because the myopia is a, is a quality of your eyes, but if you, are, if you have myopia and you're wearing glasses, then you probably have it corrected. And so you're not nearsighted, you have glasses. So you can see as, about as well as anybody else or like, you know, within, within a margin of error. And so do you have myopia? Kind of, but kind of not, depending on whether it's been corrected. And so you, you basically have created or it's used environmental means of adjusting your biological traits in order to, in order to make them more to your liking. Maybe you don't like wearing glasses. Maybe, you've, maybe you're, you're fine, you don't like the aesthetic of it, and so you just don't wear glasses, and it's, you know, it doesn't really bother you that much. That's fine, I'm not judging you. So then there's the question of, well, for the subset of people in the world who have myopia but don't have corrective lenses of any kind, what are we saying is causing them to be myopic? Are we saying it's the large component of their genes that it contributes to myopia? Because we know there are lots of genetic factors that contribute to myopia. Or are we saying it's, the, it's their lack of access to glasses? That's, that's a very genuine, difficult question of like, what exactly is making them myopic? Is it their genes, their environment? Obviously, these things are, are, are interacting in fairly, in, in fairly robust ways. And so to what they have available to them, where they live, things like that. So, Underneath that is biological theory debates and, and essentially political theory debates. So, um, so, the way, so as, um, as Tabry explains in the book, um, some of this can sort of be understood fairly well in a, a sort of a, a classic fight between two figures in, in, in theoretical biology in the 1930s. So on one side you have Lancelot Hogben. He was one of the early developers of experimental biology, a developmental, bi a developmental biologist, and also it's a, and also a very, um, a very uh, uh, ardent political leftist. On the other side, you have R.A. Fisher. If you ever use Fisher's exact test inside statistics class or something like that, he developed much of modern statistics. He was also, he was also extremely conservative and he was also a prominent eugenicist. Well, Hogben was, a, was one, of the most critical, uh, one of the most vocal critics of, of eugenics. They got into a fight over what is the nature of interactions between genes and environment such that Hogben thought it was much more important to think about the interactions between genes and environment, and, and Fisher was, a little, was a, little more, a little less interested in those interactions, saying that we didn't really need to worry about them as much. How did that relate to their, to their political theories? Well, Fisher w wanted to essentially eliminate uh, traits that he found to be undesirable, and so genes causing myopia, genes causing any kind of, any kind of mental disorder, like, let's try to get rid of them. They are bad. We don't want them around. Let's, let's just get rid of that. Whereas Hogben, Hogben made the point that, well, why don't we think about the way that we can sort of bend our biology, wearing glasses, to our society, or bend our society to our biology, and try to deal with those together? And the way it turns out in the case of myopia is that it's not just whether or not you have the, the traits, but it's also what kind of environment did you grow up in? So if you look internationally, who has higher rates of myopia or lower rates of myopia, if you have very high intensity educational systems, where you make eye strain a sort of permanent part of childhood development, then you have higher rates of adult myopia, where you basically have children concentrating, staring at books, screens, whatever. And so it's not just whether or not you have the traits, but it's also how did you develop. And so this, again, this is, this is your theoretical biology debates and also political theory debates, and they're not very far separated. So the way, the way Nancy Krieger, a, a, a very prominent uh, figure in population health put it, and this is one of my favorite, favorite article titles, health equity and the fallacy of treating causes of population health as if they sum to 100%. Like, it just doesn't work that way, and so she criticizes things like exactly that model, saying these don't add up, you need to deal with it. But I think there's a, there's a fair criticism or a fair frustration here, which is like, okay, 
Krieger, like, what do you say we should do instead? Like, well, use this model. <laughs> and it's called the eco-social model, and I think it's basically, insofar as the theory can be right, like, basically right. Like, this is how health works, but it is a giant mess, <laughs> and I refuse to show it in most of my classes, because it's like, okay, so in the middle, you have the distribution of health in a population, and, but the racial and ethnic inequality is interacting with the gender inequality because of intersectional relationships, and then class is there at the same time, but it changes over the life course, and so as you develop, they're gonna change differently, but then you have the interactions between local, uh, local context and national context. It's like, okay, like, yes. And so we have this problem <laughs> of how, like, how are we supposed to communicate about this thing? And so if we wanna say like, some sort of comparison between like, well, zip codes do matter a lot and they matter maybe more than genetic codes. It's like, okay, but trying to do it as the just versus thing, like let's not fall into the trap of saying it's nature versus nurture because we've known for quite a long time that it just isn't versus. Um, that doesn't mean we can't say things are more important, but, it all, but what that does mean is we need to decide in what sense things matter to us. And so that's the other point I wanna make about, about this um, zip codes mattering more than genetic codes. So the way this was uh, articulated by Jeffrey Rose, who is sort of like one of the sort of the, sort of the proto developer of population health, he, he died relatively young, sort of just as population health was starting to become a thing. Um, he sort of gave some of the original ideas to it. He said that there, there are two fundamentally different questions that we conflate together and if we want to actually do good work inside the, in, inside the field of population uh, and the general goal of, pr of promoting good health, we need to get straight on which one we're trying to do. And so the question is, are we interested in the causes of cases or the causes of incidents? There are different ways of, of articulating this. But one of them is thinking about, so take the case, take the existence of one of the most massive, massive well studied health disparities inside the entire health disparities literature internationally. So inside the United States, black Americans and white Americans have vastly different health experiences when it, turn, when it comes to um, heart disease. Age of onset being, being earlier among black Americans, um, risk of a fatality as opposed to having, as opposed to not dying from it. Um, Prevalence of, of high blood pressure, all sorts of other, all sorts of other factors that, inter, that relate to it. Heart disease is just so much worse among black Americans compared to white Americans. It is also equally true that there are a massive number of genes that are, that, that, are, that are affecting cardiovascular health. Together they add up to a very large, a large portion of how much, how much risk an individual person has. And so there are estimates saying that, um, saying that there's a massive amount of heritability of, of uh, cardiovascular disease. And so when you go to the doctor, go to the doctor they say, do you have a family history of heart disease? And if the answer is yes, they're like, okay, like let's, let's work on this because it really does matter. There's also a bunch of research looking at, okay, so do those, do those genes that we know have an impact on cardiovascular health, do they differ in frequency among black Americans and white Americans? We know because of the, st st the statistical tools that we use that we are unlikely to have missed any massively powerful genes that are causing these disparities because we could, they're fairly easy to find. If they, have a, if they have a big loud signal, we would hear them. And so map those on. So we have gene differences, racial differences. Do they overlap? Big study, zero. They don't overlap at all. There's no relationship between the two of them. Maybe almost a signal, no, no kind of nothing. So what that means is that we know that there are differences between populations, there are differences between individuals, but they're not the same causes. And so the causes of one kind of variance are different than the causes of another kind of variance. The reason why one person dies earlier than another person or is more likely to have a heart attack than another person is different from the reasons why one neighborhood or one racial group or other kind of group is, is having, uh, having different, uh, different effects. And so it's not that either of them is more or less important inherently, it's just a question of which one do we care about for a particular time and for a particular purpose. And so the things that are causing our population health problems or our population disparities are not necessarily the problems that are causing our individual disparities. And so they can just both matter at the same time. But then there's the question ethically, could they matter, can we say that they, that zip codes matter more in some sense? And I can, I'm not gonna give, spend too much time on this because I could sort of spend ages on it. Um, I, I've, uh, I've written a little bit about this. I have an article that was published last year um, 
uh, uh, Goldberg published an article in 2014. I think there actually is a case to be made that, that in fact zip codes do matter more than genetic codes in one particular way. So whether you're trying to address the problem of zip codes or genetic codes, either way you're trying to make people healthier. We're all trying to, we're all trying to help people here. So we're trying to address the problems that make some people die earlier than others. So either way, we're trying to make more health in the world. You can measure it all sorts of different ways. You can, you can articulate different ways. You can say it's about my collection of patients. You could do it about a community, whatever. We're all trying to make them healthier. But one of those strategies is actually also going to have another effect. It's going to be addressing inequities inside our society. So one of these, one of these goals is going to be promoting justice. The other one's just going to be promoting, uh, promoting uh, overall gains. I'm happy to make gains in general, but actually addressing the disparities between those neighborhoods, that is another very important goal that we would be addressing at the same time. So the fact that those different neighborhoods in Dallas are so vastly different, that's also a goal that I would, that for my, in, in my sort of political, the, my political theory, I think that kind of goal is gonna override most other ones. Like, wow, that's really different. We should really work on that first, basically. But we can talk about that more later, complex ethical issues. Okay, so about this whole culture of health thing. So, so, it's, so whether or not it's, whether genes or, it's, genes or environment matter more, whether zip code or genetic code matters more, that's one issue. But then what about this claim that, there, that we need a culture of health? So there are different ways of trying to, of trying to address this. Um, I find doing international comparisons to be very helpful because it's very, hard for, it's very hard for any society, but I think Americans are especially a little bit insular in thinking only about the United States. Um, we're very, uh, yeah. Uh, it's helpful to think about this inside an international context. So this is a very important report that was put out by the National Research Council and the Institute of Medicine um, in 2013 or so. And so they basically did a, a breakdown of what are the different things that could be causing U.S. health to be falling behind other countries. And so the, the U.S. On, by most measures is doing worse than other wealthy countries. And the question is, what could it be doing? What could be doing it? Could it be the air we're breathing? Could it be the water we're drinking? Could it be relatively higher rates of homicide? Could it be poor prenatal care? Could it be, could it be family structures? Could it be that we spend relatively less on public health? Could it be um, problems with access to healthcare? And they sort of asked it systematically, could it be all these different things? And the answer to all of them is probably yes. And that was like the most disappointing possible answer, like not only because of the yes, but also the probably, where it's like, not sure, probably. Like, it would be really nice if there was like a single thing that was broken. And this is the thing that just drives me bonkers about, the, about all of the sort of political discourse around healthcare reform. It's like, yes, we need to reform healthcare. Please don't think that reforming healthcare is going to solve our health problems. Our health problems are so much bigger than that, and I really don't want to like undermine any attempts to like fix our healthcare, whatever that looks like. But that is not going to buy you what you think it's going to buy. So like, please don't, because I'm worried that people are going to, like, on the off chance we actually fix healthcare in some sort of sense, we make some sort of like massive leap towards that. If people think that's going to make them that it's going to solve our health problems, that would be really sad because I'd be so disappointed. Like, that just isn't gonna do that, I'm sorry. Um, and it turns out that just putting money into healthcare, as you may have noticed, doesn't really make things much better. Um, so this is a graph looking over time. So it's a, the arrow is, so 1970, 1972, 1974, going all the way up through 2014 on here, showing basically the trajectory of how much we spend on healthcare. So this is how much we spend per person, and this is how many years of life it buys us. So ideally you wanna be as far over here as you can and as far up as you can, because you wanna buy as much life as you can for as little money as you can. And we did the opposite. <laughs> and so we started, then it's like, so we basically plateaued around 2008, 2010. We haven't actually made any major gains on that recently. Um, I'll actually talk more about that in a moment. But we are massively increasing the amount of money we spend on healthcare every single year. And it is just not buying us as much as we want it to buy. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to fix the healthcare system. This isn't, again, like, I don't want people to think it's like, oh, that means we should just like abandon the healthcare system. Um, so, so for instance, if you look at the most recent data, this was, this actually was in the news recently. Um, so the estimate is that if we, eat, that if we made Medicare available to everyone inside the United States as opposed to just people over 65, 
then it would probably cost us 13% less total than we are paying now. So it would cause us to go back a little bit in that direction, which is nice. And it would also save roughly 1.7 million uh, years of life every year, uh, which is almost, coincidentally almost exactly the same number as, and this is just a coincidence, as the, the total number of years lost due to the opioid epidemic. Um, so canceling that out in terms of number of years lost, lost would be great. But even if we did that, we would still be worse off than all the other. We would still be farther over to the right and farther down than all the other countries that are like also wealthy. So like it'd be great to do better, but we would still be worse off even if we did better. That sucks. <laughs> um, so th so this is actually a period of good news in some sense. Um, although like right now there's a, I think there's a presidential briefing on the COVID nineteen coronavirus. So like you know, there's bad news too. But in, but in January, we actually got news that for the first time in three years, we actually had an increase in life expectancy by five weeks, which was like a huge gain because we had three straight years of, dec of decline, which hasn't happened for 100 years. Um, the last time that happened was during the Spanish flu epidemic, which was the largest epidemic in human history. So that was, so like things are looking a little grim, like we could do better. And so, so this is the extent of the problem. So basically, this is big. And so what could be causing it? What kinds of things are leading to these problems? And so uh, I was showing this graph to some other people earlier. Um, well, if you look at the United States, we have things like an especially steep gradient of wealth and health. So uh, pretty much every social context has some sort, of, some sort of effect such that having more money is awesome and then you get to have more nice things including a longer life or healthier years. You can sort of do this with, with, um, with, um, um, with uh, basically quality of life as opposed to, uh, as opposed to years of life. It works out basically the same way. So it just happens to be the case in the United States, ours is especially steep and so that the bottom 1% is living into like maybe their 70s and the top 1% is living like well into their, into their upper 80s. And it just is so, it's so interesting that it's so smooth so that every single percentile of income that you go up, you actually get like a substantial increase in how many years you get to, you get to like be on this earth. That seems really interesting. And so could this be in, in, in impacting other aspects of our society? And so, I'm, I imagine some of you are wondering, like, oh, I wonder how that map earlier lines up with things like racial privilege and who lives in which neighborhoods. Like, like yes, I wonder if there's some sort of relationship between wealth and race. It's like, we could look into that. We could see maybe that the median household wealth is 10 times higher for white Americans compared to black or Hispanic Americans. Like, I wonder if that has anything to do with widespread cultural practices like denying land ownership to black, you know, black and brown families. I wonder if it could be related to that. Oh, what if we had a, a whole inheritance system that was based around transferring property? Huh, I wonder if that could affect people's health then because money, like, oh, I see. So this is actually kind of a big problem, like, yeah. So this is quite wide. And the response by the, by the population health community is um, part of it is what's called the health and all policies movement and also the, uh, the uh, exhortation that we need intersectoral collaborations. Um, this is articulated in different ways. So it started taking, taking effect in the, the, the WHO Adelaide report. It was saying that we, need, that we need trade unions, we need commerce and industry, we need academic associations, we need religious leaders, we need all of them working to advance the health of a community in order for us to actually get the kinds of effects that we want. They need, the, they need to together provide the, what they call the impetus for health action. This eventually turned into what's called the health and all policies approach. And it says that it seeks to improve health and at the same time contribute to the well-being and the wealth of nations through structures, mechanisms, and actions planned and managed mainly by sectors other than health. And so it is great that, that the, healthcare, uh, the healthcare system should be part of this effort, obviously, but then we need to have our economic systems changed in order for to, if we want to have better health. We're not going to have va vast differences in health gains if we don't have you know, things like improved in, in, or increases in wages and making sure that people don't go to work sick. That actually seems all the more important while we're in the middle of a giant pandemic or, well, it's not a pandemic now, but it'll probably be a pandemic in like next week. So like, like it's a pandemic to be, it's like it's totally gonna be a pandemic, so just call it one. 
And as this, uh, as this document piloted by the American Public Health Association and a bunch of other organizations together says that population health and equity, so the, this distribution of, of benefits, and, uh, benefits and drawbacks, um, depends on collaborative intersectoral action. But then it goes even deeper than that. So um, Kickbush and Gleicher, they do some excellent work on health theory. Um, they say that we, we don't really just need a whole of government approach, that's too easy. What we need is actually a whole of society approach. And so they take, for example, um, smoking bans. You can, a, a legislature can say, we're going to ban smoking and that's going to help improve our health. It's not something that's managed by the healthcare system, but it's just like a, a by fiat, we're gonna say no smoking or no smoking inside, inside restaurants, something like that. Well, that doesn't really mean anything if people don't actually enforce it. And so if the restaurant owners are like, who cares? Um, and nobody follows the rule, then it's pointless. And so it's not just that we need to have different policies officially written into stone or written on, onto paper, it's that we need to have different ways, of, uh, different ways of actually changing our behaviors at the cultural level. And so we need to all be bought into this in some sense. Or take something like climate change. So this is a model of all of the different processes and strategies and different areas of society that should be involved in trying to address the, the health impacts of climate change. And so the climate changes, increases in temperature in some places, decreases other places, more severe storms, which I hear you don't like in Texas. Um, uh, it's extreme, extreme heat waves, I hear those also suck. Cause, those, the, those things cause, uh, cause uh, um, cardiovascular failure, and especially in, uh, in people who already have heart disease and among the elderly, so things that are very bad, expands areas where malaria spreads, all sorts of nasty stuff. And so this is a model that says, here are all the things that should be involved in that. Here is medical care, right over there with that little arrow. But it's the entirety of society that is involved in the creation of greenhouse gases, how we respond to it, possible, respond, uh, possible ways of, of changing our policies. So we need disaster response teams, we need better housing, we need, to, we need building codes that are actually making sure that we're prepared for, for extreme weather. We need to have economic systems that are going to be, that are going to be designed around the, around the expectation that we're gonna to have to deal with these costs. We need, to, we need food systems that are going to be resilient and are going to be prepared to have, have extreme events that change the availability of certain kinds of foods. We need all of that stuff in order to actually protect our health and so, health, so medical care, yes, great, one piece. So that's, the basic, that's sort of the basic idea. And then there's this idea that, that, um, that, that we know the culture of health should also be going very deep. And so what is, what in one sense what that means is we need to think about how deeply ingrained some of these practices that we have inside our culture and how they're actually impacting our health. So for instance, there's a big upsurge in research, of research on incarceration and health. And so some of it had been sort of old hat where it was, um, it was, it's been known for literally hundreds of years that prisons are places where infectious diseases spread. Like, surprise, surprise, they're like high density, high density, no, not a lot of care about what happens to people inside, like, you know, bad places. And so that was relatively obvious, but now there's more and more research on what, do, what does, the, what does the, the US mass incarceration process, what does that do to health overall? What, do, what does it do to disruption of family systems? What does it do to a disruption of, of losing a worker at a, at a job? What happens, uh, what happens when someone tries to go back into the workforce and people, and every time they, they, they try, to, try to sign up for a job, have you ever been incarcerated? It's like, okay, well now we have poverty. And that also is going to be transmitted intergenerationally because if you don't ever get to buy, if you can't ever rent an apartment or you can't buy a house, then you don't, then you don't, to, don't get to transmit any wealth. And then here we are again. And so, so thinking about things like the way that our justice system is impacting our health and what does that mean for how we think about punishment, fairness, justice? I mean, the, so it's not just that this is another area of society where we have to sort of like think about what, it, what matters to it. We need to very seriously think about what are we willing to accept as the health outcomes or the health impacts of something like the way what we do with people after, when they do something bad. And so it, I'm not saying there's a particular answer to this. I mean, restorative justice models, things like that, these are all promising, but it's just saying that the, the depth of the questions that if we don't actually change, if we don't actually address what we're trying to accomplish with our, with our justice system, then we're not gonna actually fix this. And so these are very, very deep questions. So um, is the population health rhetoric appropriate, at least this sort of like 
your zip code matters more than your genetic code or as much as, and uh, we need a culture of health instead of something else. Um, are they right? Are they appropriate? Mm, mostly, basically, yeah. Um, I think zip codes, I think zip codes do matter more than genetic codes, but with the caveat, but they're not really competing with each other. They're existing at the same time. And also, it sort of depends on what you're going for. And if you want to, if you want to prioritize the, the advancement of justice across society, and I think there are reasons why we should do that in general, like that justice is sort of like the thing for a society, um, then I think we should care more about it. But it's that we also don't have to care about it exclusively. So complicated to answer, but yes. Do we need a culture of health? Um, is there something different or something else that we could take? Um, I think it's this, uh, this claim is right in both senses. I think we need something as broad as a culture of health and also something as deep as a culture of health. I don't think anything, anything more narrow or more shallow will get us where we want to go. Um, so for all the reasons I said, um, and then I, I just, uh, it's just going to raise, especially that depth question, it's going to raise all sorts of questions that we haven't really been prepared for. So I think we're, we're ill-equipped for the upcoming conversations and they are on the horizon about whether or not housing is a human right, for instance. Or if it's not a human right, is it a thing we just owe to people? Is it a, a necessary part of a health strategy? So there are efforts to sort of do this in a local context. It also turns out to maybe be cheaper than having homeless people. Like it's actually very expensive to ho have homeless members of society because you have to, basically you're constantly causing people to have problems and you have to, you have to try to fix them. And so economic insecurity and, and you know, need, needing food assistance or needing emergency medical care. So like it actually might save money to give people houses, but like even if it doesn't, maybe we should do it anyways because like it seems just. But, like, what, but we need to figure out what we want to do about that. So I'm sort of, I'm optimistic about some of the conversations these will spur, and maybe we can talk about some of this stuff today. Thank you, and thank you to like a lot of people. This hasn't, I need to like keep updating. Like, thank you to, it's, you know, it takes a village. Here's the village, and here are the people I cited. <laughs>
it's, it's hard to know what to do with that information. Like, I, I, in some sense, the U.S. is sort of like the worst, the worst equipped to sort of deal with this because our problems are sort of like very, very, I mean, every, every health, every health, every country's health status is built into its cultural system. It's just that ours seems to have like a lot more creaky parts than others. And so I don't really know what to do about that other than just sort of first put it on people's radars that this is like their problems do go that deep. And then like, okay, let's have a conversation. Like what's my like, first step is acknowledging you have a problem. <laughs> and then maybe it looks like, okay, like what do you do? Finland, like that you seem to be doing better. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that's not much of an answer, but it's, uh, but we're checking. <laughs> Several times you touched on length of life increasing, mm -hmm. especially as it relates to cost. Can you talk about quality of life? Is it really worth hitting 85 if your quality of life or your quality of your health is poor as compared to say age 80? Yeah. This country and other countries. Yeah, there, there are lots of, um, I think there are lots of interesting, um, interesting cases here. So, um, so in some sense, I'm a bit of an anomaly among my peers um, in that I, I defend the World Health Organization's um, definition of health, which most of my peers think is uh, god awful. Um, they say that health is the essentially the presence of well-being rather than the absence of disease, um, and I think that's kind of cool. Um, so I want to draw a very firm distinction. I want to say that if you live in, let's say, a repressive regime, um, take Cuba. Uh, it's been in the news, and Bernie Sanders quote or whatever. Yeah, so, so it's been in the news as far as like, what do we, how do we talk about a place that is, that has good outcomes in one measure, but also has terrible outcomes broadly construed in another measure. And so people are not dying of their conditions, but they might have limited ability to pursue the pursue their the lives that they want, political expression, all those sorts of other things. I want to say that those things are constitutive of health. And so whatever health, whatever well-being means to you as an individual or as a society. Um, I want to say that you should you you have, you should be you should get to have that, and so just the absence of dying or dying young is great, but that's not that's not the extent of the thing. And so so I so I think um, so I want to I would say that that Cuba is a place that has great great length of life, especially considering like the ratio of like basically living in basically having like extreme poverty compared to the United States, but not dying from it. But not dying is not what we're going for here, and so so is that good health? Like, depends who you ask in Cuba. I think some people like it, but like it seems like it's not great. I make the same point. I, I make a parallel point in the book about, um, for instance, there you could have a you could have hypothetical countries where you have real countries that have, for instance, low rates of um, of all sorts of um, obstetric and gynecological diseases. That doesn't mean that women have women have good health. Not if they don't have reproductive freedom, for instance. And so okay, like like low rates of cervical cancer but you don't get to decide if and when you have children. Like, that's not health. Yeah. So, um, about the health wealth gradient specifically, I would, mm -hmm. and you mentioned how, I forget the exact number, but the more money you have, it can buy you more time on earth. Yep. I was wondering um, how much later life wealth acquisition. So say you come into a bunch of money in your mid to late 30s how or 40s, how could that affect the outcome? Does it decrease the total um, effectiveness of wealth versus how much health you can buy? Yeah, I think about this a lot for even personal reasons. Like, so, um, so for instance, this is, um, there are different ways of measuring this. They used um, life expectancy at age 40. Um, it's not vastly different because most people live past 40 anyways, but so like, so like I'm, I'm a couple years away from being 40 and so I'm like, like, come on raise, like, I want to get my number as high as I can when I hit 40 <laughs> and sort of like, I bet I can go up one percentile by then and <laughs> just getting harder and harder. <laughs> um, so it's, it's like, it's kind of like, it kind of gets in my head a little bit. Um, there's a little bit of research on Actually, there's a good amount of research, especially on early adverse um, adverse life experiences, and so there's so um, so inside the book. So I don't know, I don't just defend um, the World Health Organization's definition of health. I actually slightly modify it, and I say that we shouldn't. I think it's generally a mistake to think about health as a thing that exists at a point in time. I think it's a thing that exists over a trajectory of life. Um, uh, I have a bunch of reasons for that. If you read Chapter Three, if you're interested. <laughs> 
Um, but the, the, the basic idea is um, when you go to the doctor and they take your blood and they say like, okay, at the moment your blood pressure is this and your cholesterol is this and yada, yada, yada. Um, that's, I don't think that's, that's not really what your health is. Your health is the thing that is your entire life. And so if you had um, extreme mistreatment during childhood, hunger, poverty, whatever, and then later on o over the course of your life, you start having better, uh, better living conditions, it, it could be, depending on what those early childhood experiences were, it could be you can't basically shake those. And so it could be that you, in some ways, are doing much better now, but the, but the physical or emotional trauma or whatever from, uh, from earlier could be much worse. Or it could be the other way around. It could be you, you started out in wonderful conditions and something bad happened, and now you're worse off. And so I'm more interested in basically like the, looking at that entirety of the life. And so if someone is, is basically at this level right here, but they used to be up here, I'm, I want to worry about them. Whereas if they were down here and they're up here, then, I'm, then I think that's great. Whereas I think if we just think at that moment in time, then it would say they're neutral. I, th I think there is a difference between those two healths. And so I'm, I care again about the sort of trajectory about where we're going and um, basically sort of tracking what kind of life are we living and where, where are we leading to? Because I also want to think intergenerationally about this because there's more and more research on not just from epigenetics, but from um, intergenerational transmission of trauma, from, from, from slavery, from land displacement of indigenous peoples and so, and so on and so on, that we basically don't just like exist inside this vacuum of like, okay, today you're, this, is your heart, this is your heart rate, this is your blood pressure. Like, that, that's too disconnected. I think, we live, I think we live lives as movies, not as snapshots. Uh, thank you, Sean. This was very compelling. I oh. really enjoyed it. Cool. Um, I you have got one. <laughs> two, yeah. uh, two questions, oh, maybe not. Um, <laughs> more philosophical questions, and I think that they're related. Um, and it was really helpful that you sort of gave some more background as to what your definition of health is and, and what you find compelling about. Yeah, there's a lot here. Sorry. It's about, like yeah. Um, and, and my question is coming from a sort of uh, a feminist background and thinking about maybe Iris Marion Young's critiques of health. Mm -hmm. um, so she, um, in some of her work, is worried about defining health um, as sort of a stable sense of well-being, mm -hmm. where your body isn't changing much, right, and it, everything just seems to be working. She says that describes middle-aged men, doesn't describe children, the elderly women. <laughs> um, so I, I'm wondering about the work that the, the, the value work, actually, that the definition of health ends up doing. Oh, yeah. So is there a way that if we, if we value health understood in a particular way, that we might actually then lead to certain populations who don't see themselves as fitting that, um, not seeking out health care because of shame or stigma around disability, for instance? Um, so I'm, I just would like to hear more from you about that. Yeah, I got there's a there's a few different questions in there. At least like I I sort of read a few different questions. So um so there's the there's the question of um of basically how do we how do we conceptualize people that are not sort of like fitting this? So like one of the key critiques of of um of of all feminism. I mean, you might have noticed my belt buckle. <laughs> uh, uh, it's the one of the key critiques of, of feminism is that basically the the centering of the basically the the male experience, especially the white male experiences. Is for the, so like. The, the adult white male is the only thing that matters, and everything else is a deviation from it. Some of this goes back to Aristotle, arguably. It's a little complicated. Um, but that, I, that idea of, of only centering that and saying, like, well, um, that aging is inherently bad as a result, or that childhood is some sort of like defective state or incomplete state, I think those are all fundamental mistakes. That's one of the reasons I want to do this sort of life course thing, that, like, that a person who is in old age and might have some sort of physical limitations, like, that's not, not inherently a bad thing. So if your if your if your legs have a harder time going upstairs, like I'm not I don't want to call that like inherently like a problem. Like it depends where that sort of fits into the trajectory of of what you want to be doing and where it's going from there. So there's that piece of it. There's a there's also the the healthism critique that's a very prominent one uh, among uh, lots of sort of social critics of, of health and medicine, including a lot of feminist crit critics. And I, I take that very seriously. I talk about it um, some in the book. So one of the one of the critiques is basically that. Um, that, that health discourse, the way we talk about health, can be very, um, very problematic. It can basically, it can be manipulative. It can be socially, it's, um, it can be socially problem. Uh, can 
be hegemonic. And so we have this idea about what health is. And so you should be eating this grain bowl and Instagram and your smoothie and like all these sorts of things. And that if you don't have a body that fits this type, then there's something wrong with you and on and on and on. And I sort of take that, I take there sort of be two different responses to that. One of them is to say that like, um, there's this, this famous volume called Against Health, where it's just like, like all that stuff about health, like I'm done with it. Like, like it is dead to me. I think that's a perfectly reasonable response. It's like, it's like this, this whole health talk thing sucks. And because we, we apparently can't have nice things. And so we don't get to use health anymore. It's like, <laughs> it's like, I, I, like I think I'm very sympathetic to that idea. Um, I, would I would rather take a different approach, although I, I, I take that very seriously. I would rather basically talk better about health. And so, so the way I try to talk about health is I want it, um, uh, as I sometimes put it, I, I want it. I want to basically have health discourse that's that's centered around hating the game, not the player. And so, I think a lot of these ideas about trying to say like, oh, like you're not living up to the standard. You should change your body. You should eat differently. Why why aren't you practicing self care? Um, the reason why you're not doing well at work, uh, like working 80 hours, is because you're not doing enough yoga. Like, like that's not that. These aren't the reasons why we have problems, and so trying to move away from that sort of individualistic focus, move away from the discourse around trying to blame people for their health, uh, trying to pathologize people's bodies as opposed to trying to see them as being being within a side of social context. So it's not just about about the biology, but also the inter environment you interact with. This also comes from disability studies, and so trying to move away from all that to thinking about systems and structures. And so I'm a big advocate of what's called. Um, Fundamental cause theory, which essentially says that we should put a special special attention and focus on trying to trace there are certain features of society that basically have these very very strong effects on health that sort of adjust over time. So money is one example, and so money has a huge impact on health. The weird thing about it is that money impacts health in vastly different ways at different times. So in 1918, money was the thing that allowed you to move out of the move out of the city when the Spanish flu was coming. In uh, in the 1930s, it was the it was the thing that allowed you to get away to allowed you to evade being drafted. In the 1950s, it was the thing that allowed you to move into a better neighborhood when there's some sort of strife. And like so, it goes on and on. So money matters differently at each different point in time, but somehow it always matters. Same thing, and this and the basically they've, they've done research and said like basically the same thing seems to hold for education. It basically, it's a tool that allows you to it, to benefit from other from other things, to benefit from tools around you better than other people. Um, so it's basically like a tool set that lets you use other tool sets. Um, uh, uh, prestige, social prestige, and also pre uh, absence of stigma is a new a new area of research there. And so having a stigmatized body for whatever reason, that just robustly sucks. And so the, what that points to is not that, that you should change your body, it's that, that stigma robustly sucks. <laughs> and so we should try to fix stigma, so things like mental health stigma, so we should address them head on, sort of like one of the sort of like lessons I take from that, that area of research. Just, just building on what you say, I think we also could think of health in relational rather than individual terms. Yeah. So that focusing on inequalities or, or uh, domination uh, 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 would allow us better insights into health as well. I'm not yeah. disagreeing with anything you said, oh, absolutely. but looking yeah, at think, stigma uh, as an example of that. Yeah, domination, power, neighborhoods, like, all, like this is, um, uh, as I sometimes say, this is where I see the action is. Like this, this is the stuff that like we should be worrying about and dealing with. Um, yeah, the, the idea that the idea that health sort of exists as this abstracted is just the genes that you inherited, and they exist only inside your skin, and they're disconnected from every other aspect of society. That that is a political statement in like the deepest possible sense, and it's it's based on assumptions that are as just as deeply political, and I think just factually wrong in a bunch of ways, as well as being morally problematic. So like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, so this question is kind of stemming off of both me listening to you talk earlier in Dr. Brown's class and out of Dr. Davies's previous question. Thanks for sticking um, it out. I feel like you're going to overdose on this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I am a philosophy major. Um, so you talk about in this notion of building a culture of health, like 
the justified like interconnected notions of all of these different systems that exist outside of just purely medicine. Mm -hmm. So things such as the justice system is one of your prominent examples. Mm -hmm. But you've also talked about how um, you want ultimately this kind of bottom-up approach or you, previ you previously used the phrase like decentering of healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, if we're talking about like a culture of health reform through like the utilization and the necessary change of those institutions, mm -hmm. how does, and if we're also like taking your position of we want to defend and reclaim the usage of the term health at all and we don't want to give it up as like overly medicalized, mm -hmm. Um, how does health then avoid this kind of technocratic critique of if all of these, if the people in all of these systems have to come in and ultimately reform these things, um, the people making decisions at the highest echelons of a lot of these systems are ultimately very insulated from the effects of their policy decisions, largely because of the wealth they already have, as like a lot of your data would point to. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, I think that a lot of that kind of perspectival focus or that kind of intersectional focus would be lost in those attempts to bridge those ultimately still very real connections between those social structure systems. How do you see health being able to escape that critique? There's a lot in there. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, the, so the easy question is basically how do we try to do genuine political reform without having it be totally taken over by powerful elites who have no interest in trying to solve it, nor do they feel the negative impacts of the what's going wrong? Like, yeah, <laughs> it is an election year. <laughs> so it's, it's like sort of like this is on everyone's mind. Um, I, I think um, there's only so much I can do in, in this sort of space as far as like what I can articulate. Um, I guess what I, sort of taking a step back, what I'm trying to accomplish with trying to do this thing, whatever this, this is, like writing the book and all that kind of thing, is to at least put some certain stuff inside the conversation. Um, I think one of, the, one of the most powerful tools that are used by some of those powerful institutions and people and things like that um, is to basically conceal a lot of this. And so I think it's really interesting. So I'm gonna guess like, how many of you have seen anything like that map? that I put up there. So if some of you, as far as like the disparities between population, things like that, th that's really changing. It wasn't really like that before. That map only existed, for instance, that particular map has only existed for a few years. But that was like, that was being put inside, um, inside that was from the, the AP, uh, the Associated Press, and so it's getting a little bit of attention. Economic inequality is like just getting on the radar. And um, healthcare reform is sort of like, has been on the radar for about 10 years, and sort of like the first draft of it was like very, um, flattening. It was like, here's here's one option. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Like, it's complicated. It's like, yes, it's all right, but like, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I, I think where there's like a moment now that like maybe we're ready to have some of these conversations. I mean, thinking historically, there were moments. There are some things that that sort of needed to happen for some of this to happen for the, some of this to occur. So. So this, this graph in particular, as I was mentioning before in the class, it was a really important um, moment inside at least the academic discourse around this to discover that not only does everyone knew since forever that being extremely poor would, be, would have bad impacts on your health. That's, that is obvious, like starvation, there, simple. Everyone knew that being extremely wealthy bought you extreme privilege. But the idea that there is this, this gradient that goes all the way across the middle class, it's not just basically a flat line and then two extremes. And so like everyone's kind of doing okay and you know, it depends on person. And then if you have like extreme wealth or extreme poverty, then like those obviously have like big impacts. And so seeing the, seeing the for example, that the, grid, the gradation of different, different class structures and how it goes all the way from the top to the bottom, that was something that was just simply not known before or hadn't been demonstrated. And now that, that original research was done inside the UK where they had free healthcare for everyone. And so it started making it possible to make claims about, well, it's not just extreme poverty that we need to worry about because there is a way of centering poverty and then saying, oh, well, that's a problem of extreme poverty. That's not a middle class problem. And so we don't care about it because in America, everyone thinks they're middle class. Like, so there's a way of trying to sort of wave these things away that I think is not working anymore. And then talking about things like the ratio between like the highest paid worker and the lowest paid worker at, at, at companies. And acknowledging that like it doesn't need to be this way. 
So like then other countries, so like the ratio is like 40 to one, not hundreds. <laughs> and so like the, so the, the possibility that it could be different or that we could live as long as Canadians is, is kind of a radical thing. The way it was put inside, um, inside Rose's, Rose's book um, is, is called The Strategy of Preventive Medicine. He starts out by saying that there's no known biological reason why every population should not be as healthy as the, as the best. So there's no, there's no reason that's sort of like written into our genetic code or to something about our bodies such that we can't all be doing this. And so what is it that's making it so that we're not getting there? Those are political decisions. But with that sort of recognition is like that is a political decision that we're not all living to our late 80s. Like that's radical. But it, but it requires talking about it and thinking about it and thinking, okay, so now, now what? So I don't know, I, I'm, I'm optimistic about talking. I don't know, I'm a philosopher. But, uh, but putting things on the radar and actually talking about them seems to open possibilities. And I'm genuinely optimistic about that. Um, one of the striking things that I've come across, and I, want, I just want to get your take on, on it, um, is that independent of sort of where you are on the grade, in, mm -hmm. uh, relative wealth or your absolute level of wealth, mm -hmm. the income inequality in the society you're in actually matters, right? So, so, so It seems to. It's like a little bit disputed, but like probably it matters. Yeah. yeah. So I wonder if you could say something about that. Yeah, so there's... Um, I haven't dug into that research that much recently. So there's, so there's, so the, so independent of the fact that like that having less money is worse off than having more. Like, nah, surprise, surprise. Um, there's a separate research saying that the, basically the level of income inequality inside a country, so just the spread, seems to be basically a negative impact on health. Um, the, I think the main hypothesis is basically it negatively impacts social cohesion. And social cohesion that sort of gets at the very like the very core of a society. Like, do you have a culture that actually is united, or you basically have the haves and the have-nots so so vastly different that they're barely not they're not even part of the same thing anymore? Uh, I think it's sort of the, the general idea. Um, there, there there is some evidence that 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 is the case, and so if um, if that is the case, then like basically, what do we do with that fact? Um, I know what I want to do about that fact. <laughs> um, uh, I don't need to get into all of that right now. <laughs> um, basically, I think that um, I think the linking up of the movements to create conversation and change of some sort around economic inequality, health inequality, um, housing inequality, food inequality, food deserts. These have been somewhat disparate efforts. Um, They've, all, they've been separated from things like the environmental movement has not traditionally dealt with these things, although sort of environmental movement 3.0 is starting to. So the linking up of these things as sort of like joint efforts and part of like a bigger problem is something that I'm very optimistic about. And so, so the fact that there is research showing that economic inequality seems to matter, like, like good, let's keep pulling at that thread. Let's see what happens. Let's see like what kind of, what kind of level of inequality is actually doing this. Like maybe we'll actually see some solutions. What kind of countries are actually doing better? There's, there are places where the, the ratio is relatively low. I think, for instance, I think Japan, the ratio is relatively better. It's also like the highest life expectancy of any country. So like what, what is it that's going on there? Um, it might not be causal, but it's interesting. And so I think it's cool that we're actually checking this stuff because we like 40 years ago, we weren't. Mostly. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering, like, what are some solutions to educate physicians um, in implementing these like cultural differences and um, approaching like the whole clinical narrative of their patients when they have such like little time with their patients? Because mm -hmm. then they just tend to like prescribe medications that their patients might not be able to afford later on. And do you think like there should be more of a holistic approach and um, like how do you go about changing that culture in the United States that is very different to like other countries in the world? Yeah, this is such a complicated one since I both spend most of my time with pre-medical students um, and also think there's always sort of like limited capacity for, I don't, uh, so there's sort of like, a, it's a double-edged sword. So um, insofar as healthcare is sort of is not the only thing that's sort of like the only game in town that's sort of affecting our health, um, that in some sense changes the amount of blame we should be putting on physicians. I think it's unfair 
to say that like, oh, the reason why I'm not healthy is my doctor's fault. It's like, well, that's not probably how it goes. Maybe to some extent, but like the, the idea that doctors can sort of be the, are the cause of or the solution of all of our health problems, I think is sort of wrong on both ends. Um, but is, what, can we, what can physicians actually do? So there's a really cool model that's being developed more and more. There's some, uh, you can look it up fairly easily. Um, I think Metzl has done a lot of work on this, although I'm trying to remember. I'm having a, it's been a long day. Um, uh, M-E-T-Z-L. Uh, it's called the um, uh, structural competence. And so what it does is it sort of frames the idea of understanding the structures of society. So stuff like this, stuff like neighborhood inequalities, how access of transportation affects ability to achieve various health goals, whether or not people like from different neighborhoods can get to your doctor's office is pretty basic stuff. Like, like here, take this, take this drug. It's like, where do I get it? Like at that pharmacy across the town, like the one that doesn't go on the bus line. <laughs> like, so things like that. So, um, so it frames it as basically a, a core competence of being a good physician is understanding where you fit into the system. Because if you, if you understand just the patient, which is already super hard because like bodies are just like, just like oh, look at all these old things, all the tubes and stuff like that. It's so complicated and there's, you have eight minutes with each patient and it's just, it's just too much. It's just too much to try to like do another thing. So like adding to the checklist, I get that that's not gonna be like a plausible solution to everything. But the idea that, that, that a, that a well-educated physician knows about this stuff and is able to, to operate sorry, uh, lowercase o operate sort of like, uh, to, is able to, to do their job understanding that this is the stuff that's happening. I think I, think I, I would sort of venture to, I think the sort of the, the implication, and I would sort of venture to make this sort of like a little more blunt since I'm, I'm an ethicist, I get to sort of say normative things. I think you're actually ill-prepared as a physician if you don't understand where you fit into this system. So if you think, for instance, that the US healthcare system is, is, like, is uh, performing at its peak compared to other ones, I, I think you're not, doing a good job. I think you are undereducated, like, like just like flat out. And so what does it allow you to do if you know that? Well, then you can understand that maybe some of the processes should not be assumed to be great. And so like one of the things I sort of take it as like a moral obligation of my own to like to explain this, to, uh, to explain and basically demonstrate to like former, uh, to future physicians is the ones that think that US health is doing basically amazing, like, like, like start from the position of knowing that it's not compared to other places and recognizing at least the possibility that it could be better, and then, then go from there. I'm not telling you not to be a doctor. I'm telling you like, to think that we're sort of winning is just not true. <laughs> uh, two quick questions. Okay. Uh, first, First, do you think uh, we should redefine what rich, what middle class, and what poor is? Because from what I've noticed is that some people that are middle class consider themselves poor, and some people who are poor consider themselves middle class. Um, so I feel like maybe those three words and what they mean and entail, I feel like is a thing that maybe is stopping that like cultural change that, um, from what I understand, you were kind of pushing for. Uh, second of all, how come survival programs aren't more, I guess, uh, implemented since uh, after learning about like the Black Panther survival programs, I thought it was an amazing thing and it had like fast results and really positive results, but due to things that they were kind of like shut down. Uh, so I feel like survival programs are kind of a good and maybe cheap solution to that cultural change that is kind of being put like needed. Yeah, um, yeah, so, so, okay, so let me address these in order. So, um, actually, I'll, I'll, actually, I'll start with the second one because um, I actually sometimes start my presentations with the Black Panthers. Um, I just hap didn't happen to this time. So, it was sort of like a pivotal moment when I was writing the book that I was sort of thinking about what am I trying to add to the conversation and like which fields and ideas am I trying to link up with. So I was, I was sort of like, I was sitting down in the evening, like working past my usual hours, because like, you know, I don't get to work 40 hours a week. And like, okay, I'm gonna catch up on reading. And so I'm like reading all the journals that I'm supposed to be reading. So I pick up like um, uh, the journal Public Health Ethics, and they have like a special issue on 
um, the, the nature of, of the republic and the relation between the individual and the society and like, like oh my God, this is so boring. <laughs> like I just do not find this interesting. I was like, like, I, like I, I, don't, I, I know lots of people find it interesting, like individual versus society and like what kinds of rights and obligations do we have and vaccines is like, 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 yes, that's interesting to some people. It's like, I'm just not feeling it at all. And so then I, I pick up the American, American Journal of Public Health, which is the, um, the Journal of the American Public Health Association, which is, I think, the largest such association in the world. And they had a special issue on the Black Panthers and how they, how they relate to, the, to Black Lives Matter. I'm like, yes, yes, this is my scene. I want to hang out with these people more. So like, yes, what is the legacy and how does that connect? So they did, they did this issue, like thinking about like, what is, the, what is the history of you know, basically black empowerment movements and trying to reclaim health and to try to create local community structures to promote health when basically the larger society had decided not to do that at all. And so it's like, well, you're not gonna, we're, not, we're not gonna build clinics for you. Like fine, we'll build clinics for ourselves. And maybe we'll even steal some of the stuff it takes to, 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 to actually staff it because like, we'll, we're, like you're not giving it to us and so we will, we will take things into our own hands. Um, that's, not to, that, that's not to romanticize the Black Panthers because obviously they had a lot of problems and they, the, the movement didn't sort of, didn't turn out the way they wanted it to. But, the, but thinking about what are ways that basically radical efforts to try to reclaim health and to try to do things from the bottom up within a society when the society itself had basically decided to not do that. I think that I find that to be very illustrative because it sort of shows the, the powers and the limitations of sort of waiting for something else to happen from the top down. I'm very, I'm very skeptical about sort of waiting for political systems to sort of give us a healthcare system that we deserve. And so I think if we want one, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to ask for one. Um, but if we're not asking for one, they're, they're definitely not gonna give us one. <laughs> and so, and so, it's, so I, I'm, I wanna prioritize that sort of effort to, to sort of think about what are the ways that we can sort of like draw on social justice movements and to see what we're trying to do as the, as the promotion of social justice, um, which is something I take to be sort of core to the field of population health, that since it's, it essentially it explicitly says we're worried about health disparities. And there's basically a very, like right under the surface there is a normative claim that there's something wrong with what we're doing. And so, so saying that like what we're trying to do is to, is to advance justice inside, inside society, I think that's sort of a good first step. And sorry, um, remind me again what, the, what, the, what your first point was. It was about the, um, uh, I just lost it. Uh, you're fine. Uh, my, uh, or the other question was, do you think we need to redefine what rich, what middle class oh, yeah, and yeah, the, Oh yeah, the class politics stuff. Yeah, so, um, so it's, I think um, it varies by country as far as how this works, but I think, I think the US has been poorly served by essentially the, the class politics that we've had. Um, the way, we, the way we have, so we, we've had traditionally almost no, or at least for the last, for my entire lifetime, there has not been a discourse around the, the welfare of the poor, other than trying to take the things away. And so like including among like, you know, the, the Clinton administration, like it's like, oh, like we don't have wel welfare reform, like that's something we can all agree on. Like, so, it's, so that's my, so my entire lifetime, there's been basically no discourse around poverty. Maybe it's picking up a tiny bit now, but not really. And so it's been about middle class, middle class, middle class. And then rich people saying like, well, we're middle class too. We're not the 1%. It's like, well, you're still like fantastically wealthy or something like that. And so, so the, this sort of discourse around like, I'm wealthy. No, you're not. Yes, I am. I'm, so like, it hasn't done us any good. It has just not been productive. And so, and it can even cover up things. And so I think there is some, there is, so like the fact that, the, that people can have vastly different amounts of money in their vastly different incomes, but depending on where they live, whether they have access to affordable housing, trying to live on a wealthy salary in a place like San Francisco is still not, still not possible, um, depending on like what kind of resources you have, or even looking at things like um, other kinds of measures instead of just thinking about class, but thinking about um, the proportion of Americans who who t um, are basically one paycheck away from being from having like an extreme um, economic crisis, and so I think it's like sixty something percent of the country is basically living paycheck to paycheck. That's not like some sort of referendum on like the definition of what of what middle class means. I think it's sort of an undermining of like the way we talk about middle class is not really tracking onto the things we might care about. If we care about economic security, and so we can talk about talk about security and stability and well-being and sorts of other ways instead of just having it be about a particular like one, two, three version of class, which I think is not helpful. Not that class doesn't exist, but the way we talk about it, I think has not been, hasn't, hasn't done anything good for us. 
as far as I can tell. Well, that's all the time we have for questions tonight. Um, uh, I want to let you know two things before we go. Number one, uh, Sean's book um, that uh, we've, we've heard a little bit about um, is uh, we've got a representative from the bookstore out front selling copies if you want to buy a copy. Um, and we'll have a table out front uh, where uh, Dr. Fias will uh, sign your copy of the book if you want or uh, just be there to talk to you, uh, answer any additional questions that you have for a few minutes um, here. Uh, also, our next uh, event is going to be on April 8th. Ash Ashley Graham Kennedy is going to continue the conversations about health, uh, medicine, health care um, uh, that we've been having this year. So uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Vaez. Have a good night. I hope we'll see you again. Um, and uh, if you didn't grab a flyer, try to grab one on the way out so you can find our website, uh, join our mailing list, and follow us on social media. Have a good night.